Hey, before I kick off the podcast, I just want to shout out Nextdoor Clothing. Nextdoor, uh, a clothing brand based out of Bondi in Sydney. They're making really nice jeans and shirts and hats. So go and check out their full range at nextdoorsydney.com. They're also artists, so you can go and check out a range of art. They put on rad parties, and I love what they're doing. So nextdoorsydney.com for the full range. This is for Clementine and Otis. All right, this episode is brought to you by Crush Organics CBD Products, Kingpin Skate Shop, and Indosol Footwear. These companies have amazing products, but more importantly, they highlight things I value, such as health and wellness, environmental sustainability, entrepreneurship, and local small business. Um, Visit their respective websites and use promo code THT when purchasing online. And you'll get a nice little discount and you'll be supporting the THC podcast and everyone's stoked. Um, in regards to Indosol, they've been the major sponsor of the podcast uh, since episode 33. And uh, you can now use the THT promo code at Indosol in Europe, Indosol Singapore, Indosol USA, and of course Australia. All right, let's go. Terrible happy talks. Terrible happy talks. Guest is Lige Saki. Lige is a skateboarder, filmmaker, producer, husband, and father. Lige is a past guest on the show, dating all the way back to episode number ninety-five. Lige, that's how long ago it's been. What are you at now? This will be episode one hundred and forty-one, sir. Wow. Uh, In Lige's in Lige's last episode, uh, we discuss his involvement in the um, the movie The Peanut Butter Falcon, his first film. I don't know if it's his first film, but a film, his film Concrete Kids. And also we discussed uh, his involvement in the Push docuseries uh, for skateboarding entrepreneurs, the Berricks. This week, Lige is with me live from his home in Venice, California to check in and share his experiences, challenges and hopes for the future. Mr. Lige Saki, welcome. Lige, how are you, brother? <laughs> I'm doing well. I'm doing great. Dude, what's, a, what's going on in your crazy life, man? You, you said to me at the start, when we, before we started recording, you said, oh, I don't even know why you want to talk to me. I'm not that interesting. <laughs> My question to you is, why do you think you're not interesting? I don't know. It's, it's, I mean, we can go deep here right away, which is probably that insecurity from my childhood of never being good enough, you know, and like never thinking I was worthy, you know, and then, which I think it, you know, it really helped cultivate the drive, you know, but I still like get in situations where I'm like, I don't know why I'm here. Like, these guys don't want to see me. Like, I don't, they don't, why am I sitting at this table? You know, what podcast, like, what do I have to say that's going to, you know, be interesting enough for however many people listen to it? You know, it's just that <clears throat> it's, it's all childhood shit. You know, it always is. It's always something from then, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's times I feel yeah. like I've got stuff to say, you know, there's times I'm like, Oh, why not me, me, me? Why don't they want to talk to me? And then they do. And then you're like, Oh God, I'm, why do I want that? Like, <laughs> it's nerve wracking. You know, yeah. you think then, then you're like, Oh, I got to uh, say all the right stuff. And you know, mm. I don't know. I, feel I know like that you you're, yeah. uh, sorry, but I know you're someone who's quite open publicly about your sobriety. Okay. Yeah. And, I'm going to sort of hit you hard early and with this stuff. Let's get it out of the way. Like, um, would you say some of your insecurities was driving um, drinking behaviors that were negative earlier on in your life? What? Well, yeah, hundred percent. Like, well, I mean, the early days, it was you know, drinking was the you know the lubricator. You know, it 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 helped me not be afraid of you know whatever it was. If it was like dancing or I mean it wasn't dancing but talking to girls and you know uh just hanging be like being social with new groups of friends that I had I didn't know before you know all that early stuff it was it was great for that you know it didn't there wasn't like huge consequences but um you know later on I I just didn't know how to do anything without drinking so then it was (laughs) it wasn't very good 
but I, I had insecurity around anything, anything social, anything like lifey. I, I would usually have to drink to accomplish anything. And, and, and you know, it, yeah. yeah. So when, to, when it comes to things that, you know, I have a lot of practice now, you know, I think nine years into this where <clears throat> I'm not really uncomfortable that much anymore, you know? Um, but I've had to, it took a long time to get used to like doing this or not doing a podcast, but like talking to somebody, having a real conversation without being drunk, you know, it's hard to be honest and vulnerable and all that stuff when you're sober, when you were never used to it <laughs> ever, you never learned how to do that. So, um, yeah, Does that answer your question. Like, have you, yeah, it does. It's, yeah. Thanks for sharing it. I think it's, it's really important. Like, you know, you just mentioned you got, you know, nine years is pretty amazing would you say like how long in that time has it taken for you to to move away from those old behavior patterns or are they still there do you know what I mean um and when I say old behavior patterns just like that those old ways of thinking you know how long does it take to really change that um I think they're always there but you get better at like burying them or you know you like i was saying practice early earlier you just continue to you know practice new behaviors just don't focus on the old behaviors so then the new behaviors like out outdo the old ones you can't get rid of them like i i was on a you know a meeting this morning and i was talking about like fighting with my wife and if my wife fighting with my wife and if my wife you know like is in a mood, you know, or cranky, right? My initial reaction is to be like, what's up your ass? Why are you, you know, like, and start a fight with her. Like, why are you acting like this? Today's supposed to be a good day that, you know, instead of going like, oh, that, that might be her way of, of, of saying she needs a hug, you know, and going over there and be like, oh, baby, make a joke or hug her, and you know, like be be sweet. Like that's not the initial reaction. That's like practiced new behavior nine years into this thing that I still don't remember to do right away, you know. But now the it's just the awareness around shitty behaviors is there, so I either can catch myself in it, sometimes catch before it, um, but always catch it pretty close to right after it, you know, if it does come out. So. It's just timing, you know. I think I don't know if I said this last time we talked, but I <laughs> I believe that ten thousand hours into like um into new behaviors of like being a grown up, you know. I never learned how to be a grown up till I was thirty five years old, you know. And the stuff you learn as a kid is unconscious, right? Like riding a bike, you know, chewing gum, walking, reacting, being an asshole. All that stuff is is stuff I learned as a kid, you know. Um, but like the new stuff, I got to put the 10,000 hours into not reacting, hugging as my first, showing love as my first, you know, reaction and shit and shit like that. And that's, I think I'm still 20 years out of that, (laughs) the way I'm practicing. So (laughs) to be perfect at it, you know, but I'm getting better. Yeah. Yeah. Is, Is your life, is your life better than it was? Or is it getting better? Than it was when? Nine years ago? Like, the, yeah, it's been yeah. in an upward trajectory since. It's way good. Yeah. Even though you can't numb out on when life gets hard? Yeah, but what's you hard? Have little esca- but you what's can't hard? have your little escape moments. I have my skate moments. I have my surf moments. That's, I have my, I make time for that stuff. You know, it's important. Like, I don't know. I, I think it's always good. Even when it sucks, it's still good. Like, it's, the, it's just seeing that, you know? Like, if I think back about anything that I ever thought was terrible or bad that happened in my life, right? Like, tragic, whatever. I, like, I look at it now and be like, oh, that's cool that happened. That's, that's kind of good that happened. Or, you know, even, like, death and stuff, it's like it teaches you something else later. But, like, it might suck in the moment, but it's still, you know, my, my, my wife lost her mom at the, you know, in September, October? last year, you know, from, you can, obvious from COVID and, and it sucked, you know, it's been hard for her, but for me, like, there's a lot of positive things that came from that. It's it's hard to say that to her, you know, and stuff all out, but like, it brought us closer. Like it brought everyone closer, you know, 
brought my mom and her closer. Like there's so many, like my mom came out and stayed for a while and just like, I think overall it just made me care. Like the beginning of this year, I'm like, I got to cut some fat, you know, cut some fat in my life. And like, I love hanging out with my son and I love hanging out with my, my wife, even if she's cranky, like I still am in the car at four o'clock going, I can't wait to get home. Even if we fought that morning, you know, like I have people to go home to and I, like it's, I'm super grateful. I learned to be super grateful for it, you know, and, and I don't know. I, I just think it's always good. Life is always good. You just have to see it, you know? I'm serious. <laughs> no, no, no. But you just People you think I'm crazy for like... saying that, but it's like, it's, it's true. You know, I'm walking around, I got 10 fingers and 10 toes and you know, I have a great life. Like I'm pretty active at 44 years old and I get to kind of do what I want more than all the other husbands i know you know so (laughs) but you know like you i don't know i don't hear people say what you say very often do you know what i mean like it's not a common thing for people to walk around with that level of gratitude you know and it's a beautiful thing but one one thing that strikes me with you is that it's not just gratitude it's just a level of consciousness like you're more conscious of your behaviors You, you you're becoming conscious of your thinking whereas i think you know, a lot, a lot of people are just thinking unconsciously. They're not really going, okay, well, why am I thinking so, why have I got these dark thoughts? Or why am I demonstrating this dark behavior that is all about me and potentially hurting other people around me? Um, and that's a, that's a great thing. I want to advocate for conscious thinking and conscious acting. So it's good. Yeah, I mean. Anyway, I'll go. No, I, just, I, I do a lot of work around that too. You know, I get up and I, you know. I meditate and I, I read these books and like these little passages. I get reminded a lot about it, you know, and I, I don't know. It's, it's not like it, it's come easy, but I, I try to, you know, put yourself, set yourself up in the morning, you know, for the day. And it usually works. Mm. So, mm. I, Here's a question. I mean, so I was sort of started off on a real tangent and it's, it's nowhere near <laughs> any of the other. And I actually, actually have written questions down that I want to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I feel like I'm at a um, yeah. I feel like I'm at a meeting. I feel like I'm at a meeting. We're well, just so talking about <laughs> great shit. I was like, if well, I heard I this just, guy it, saying what I'm saying, I'd be like, listen to this fucking clown. Like, this is <laughs> that's not true. You know, it's like fraudulent. It sounds fraudulent. You know. Mm. But like you said, that comparison, like the real conversations that you have now compared to back when you were drinking, like. Yeah. Uh, it really highlights how fake a lot of your drunk conversations are. It's just, I just, I used to speak so much bullshit. It's in, I'm embarrassed. Like, it's embarrassing. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I just really, like, the friendships that, I know, I'll talk about, I'm, I'm nine years without a drink as well, um, which, you know, I actually don't like to say I've been nine years sober because, like, I've, I've had to, I've had to unlearn these learnt behaviours that have, I've used for survival my whole life, you know, um, and they've been predominant in my sobriety, in my sobriety as well, you know, and, and, and negative and, and hurtful. And, you know, that's been, that's been a really big challenge for me over the, over the course of time. So, and yeah. I, that's why, and that's why I was prying with you to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I still wake up selfish, you know, that's me. Like I still want, but I just try to, <laughs> make sure i think about other people also you know so it's nice man it's nice listen um you you mentioned that um look firstly like to give the listeners a bit of background you know i really am interested in having you on the podcast for a few reasons like one you're you're, we're the same age two you're a skateboarder okay uh who seems to be progressing i might add (laughs) which is weird at your age you're so old and then three and then three yeah like we do share that common thread of that i think we both really are passionate about changing our lives and and living our best life effectively you know um but also i find you very intriguing because as an australian talking to someone that's maybe working in the film industry in hollywood like it's really like it's kind of like enchanting to me and you're probably like, oh, it's a grind or whatever. But can you maybe tell us like what's going on, what you're working on at the moment in terms of your film production um, work that you do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the last couple of years were, it was kind of like hunker down and, and develop some stuff. You know, we couldn't, I couldn't make 
make much. You know, it's like the big budget stuff seemed to be getting made, but a lot of stuff that I work on, like Peanut Butter Falcon types of movies, we were just weren't making them. They weren't getting made for me at least. And um, so I ended up writing a few, a couple movies that one of them I just went off and directed um, in the desert. It's a recovery kind of story, so it's pretty cool. And uh, that's in post right now. We're editing that. Um, I have another movie that I wrote that we might be shooting in May. Um, I got a movie that I, I'm producing that's often shooting in Oklahoma right now. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like all this stuff that had been building, whether I'm, you know, a couple films I'm producing and, or stuff that I've written that I, that I got to direct, like it's all kind of happening right now, which is really cool. Cause like six months ago, I'm like, this is never, I don't know. What am I doing? Like every, <laughs> every year there's like these huge ups and downs of like, what am I doing? Why am I trying in this 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 industry of like I have a like I have a win under my belt and I still can't make you know it's like sometimes it's hard you know I mean it's all it's always hard actually like this I picked a tough industry but then it's like you know there's a bunch there's the stress of nothing going on right and then there's like the stress of abundance and I'm kind of in this like stress of abundance right now with a lot of things happening and in just time and you know I started a TV company with a friend of mine also to develop tv shows and yeah so without getting into specifics of each one of those things which i don't know that that would entertain anyone there's a just there's a lot happening that is i'm excited about especially the stuff that i got that i've gotten to like you know write and that i've gotten that people have put some trust in me to to get to make you know i usually do these like really mm-hmm. small things because i can you know i don't have to wait for someone to tell me yes and then they've slowly gotten bigger like they you know the budget's at a zero every time and it's uh it's been it's been fun i'm really grateful again to get to do that and uh, it's kind of like i just do it really for me and hopefully a few people see it you know and it's like they've like slowly gotten bigger and yeah I just we did this I just did this this movie that I just made on the desert it's, it's like about a guy that kind of burns it down and comes home really uh can well, you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, no no it's it's, it's uh, a repo- Dimon- like yeah, yeah it's it's about a guy that yeah. like come home comes home um wasted with his eight-year-old son from another lunch that they went to and and you know he, his wife kicks him out and says you're going to the desert to clean up and he ends up out and you know we shot it out in joshua tree and, and 29 palms and it's close to here but it's there's not 29 palms there's nothing out there it's just like it's wild and it, <clears throat> the story he ends up out there he gets drunk of course the first night he's out there and then he wakes up and he realizes there's nobody around so he um the guy that owns the house is like you're lucky i'm sober i can show you these meetings you can go to these meetings online it's new you know and and uh, <clears throat> so he starts toying with these, you know, I don't want to say AAA meetings on, on the Internet. And at the same time, he meets somebody out there that starts pulling him, pulling him in the other direction. And uh, it's kind of like got some thrilling vibes to it. You know, it's haunting in a way. It's, <clears throat> it's very I think it's a really real look at what recovery can look like like an, an, an option for it the way I kind of do it you know and it's something I just wanted to show mm-hmm. my whole like purpose of these stories around drinking and, and recovery is, is just to show people that like forever I thought getting sober was going to suck like I thought it was going to be awful like my father like I watched my dad get sober and smoky basements in, in Louisville Kentucky and in Michigan there was not anybody that I was attracted to in recovery so I dragged it out till I was in my 30s because I was you know terrified of like life without alcohol it was going to just be so awful and this I'm just trying to show like what this looks like to me in my life so people out there might be able to be like oh think like thinking the same way I was thinking as a as a youngster or somebody in my 20s that thought getting sober was going to be the end of the world and really it's like it's I think it's the best thing ever you know like it's it literally is the best thing ever and like like, there's like a community around like there's a huge community around it like I have so many you know friends that like people always say it's like a bunch of guys that would not normally mix like I I don't know about that I mix with all these dudes that I'm tight with these days and and this is part of what I was you know trying to show on this that it's it's not all doom and gloom and there's hope and you know yeah, I, I guess like as a, 
It makes a lot of sense. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question from the angle of like from a business perspective though. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think there's gonna? I'm so I'm sorry. Like and like I love I love that you're advocate. I love that. I love what you're advocating for. Like yeah. it's beautiful in a way. It's like it's like service work really, and I I, I pray that it, it touches the people that need to, need to see it. However, in this you know content rich world that we live in, you know how hard is it for for an idea and a movie like that to actually find an audience and, and, and reach, reach an audience and not get lost in the ether. Oh, it's super hard. Um, but like, (laughs) I was saying to the guy who's in it, who's another, I don't want to break anyone's anonymity. Um, you know, I was like, we have an audience already, like a bunch of sober guys. (laughs) Like there's a niche audience here already that would like, like, just because I've gone through recovery, if I see a show that's, like, about, you know, recovery, which I don't see often, and they're usually doomy, gloomy, um, I'll watch mm. it, you know? So, I think you have to find your niche these days, because there's so much stuff, you know? Unless it's, you know, shown to you right in your face, or everybody's talking about it, it definitely gets buried. So, I don't know. I've always tried to, like, make it for a group of people like a smaller group of people and then if it's you know truly great it'll spread but if it's not great no one's going to see it so if it's great and you can start with a small group i think it you know the cream will rise to the top so we'll see i love that i love that yeah i think you have to have you you have to have fans early on right like even with that concrete kids movie right it was a bunch two kids like goonies on skateboards and i don't know Mm -hmm. when we spoke but you know, it got lice like Hulu took it. So Showtime took it. It had its opportunity, but like it took a while for people to see it. And then, you know, the the distributor put it on YouTube on their channel. And I, and it slowly like, you know, it'd be like 10,000 people saw it and 12,000 and over time. And then I was like, this is crazy. Like, how do you know? So my my partner and I, I was like, what if we just did like some Snapchat ads for like a month, you know? So we spent 500 bucks on Snapchat ads and YouTube ads. And then we watched the the views just go up and up and up. And then we stopped after a month. And then for the next year, like every day, 3,000, 4,000 more people would watch it. And it's got a half a million views on YouTube now. Of And so many fans and people know about it. And it's like a lot of kids, which that's what I made it for anyway, you know. But it like once we got people to see it it kind of grew, you know, it did grow. I'm not going to like sell it short. Like it, it had it like Mm. half a million people. That's more people than watch trailers that are on YouTube, you know, for big movies. So I'm Mm. happy with that, you know? So it's just finding that initial group that can talk about it. And hopefully it's good. Mm. I guess, I guess I get curious about like what you're doing with your current, the movie you're talking about that you're making at the moment. I guess I get curious about like, where do you find the line between like, putting out the, the message that you want and you think is important and then balancing like what's going to be marketable and what's yeah. going to help it pay, pay for it. I guess ultimately you want it to yeah. pay for itself. And you're something. saying, how is can I right? make a living doing this stuff? <laughs> oh well, well, yeah. But, but then in the same way, like not, not compromise your creative integrity or your ethical integrity. Cause that seems like what you're trying to do there is like, it's really based in ethics, that idea. Yeah. I mean, luckily, for the stuff that I've made so far for myself, not for myself, but that I've been able to, I really had no, you know, we didn't care if it made money kind of thing, you know? And then this this one has a little more weight to it. Um, you know, our hopes is we'll make it and we'll sell it. You know, somebody will be like, that's, that's the hope, you know? You, you hope you'll make it and you can find a buyer for it when it's finished, which... We feel really hopeful about, you know, I have some, you know, great partners and that have some great pedigree that have been to some, you know, wonderful festivals over time. And, and hopefully we'll play one of those and we'll make a sale and all will be gravy. But, you know, <clears throat> they're all different. Like there's, you know, several million dollar movie movies that I'm working on that need, you know, specific cast to be made. You know, it just depends on they're all different. And they all have different pressure behind them. Like, I still haven't felt a lot of pressure because there's, the stakes aren't that high for the stuff that I, I have got to make, 
for myself, like that I've directed. So stakes are higher on this one. The stakes will be much higher on the next one. But, you know, the stuff I'm producing yeah. has some higher stakes. You know, I don't know. It's, it's a weird, it's a complicated business. It's tough to really, you know, like you attach certain casts, that'll be, it's, I almost feel silly talking about it because I'm not like the expert in the, like I would, you know. Not, it, not the expert in what? It just, like, um, <laughs> put you on the spot. Yeah, you know, but it's like there's certain films that are set up a way that are marketable from the get go, right? Because you have so and so movie star attached yeah. to that, and this, you know, and that that creates a value ahead of time that your budget has matched up against. Yeah. But then there's other stuff that are more, you know, like you're taking a chance on, you know, you're taking a chance on the filmmaker, you're taking a chance on the story that don't necessarily have that, that weight. So you don't know how it's going to do. It's not set up to do a certain number overseas or set up to do a certain number that, you know, in the distribution game. So some are, Mm. that's why I say I'm not like an expert. I'm not a, you know, a salesperson and this stuff changes yeah. daily that like, you know, the value of a movie before it's even made, you know, sometimes that, that has a number and it's just, it's wild to me. I don't understand it. I don't understand why certain people are worth certain amounts of money and others are not. And, you know, I'm, mm. I just want to make great stuff, you know, that people love. So I try to stay out of that business, but in the end, I still need to know what, what's possible, you know, to put movies together and, and to, you know, get through development and, and, yeah, and get it to you, actually be in, to just, be in production. But I like the stuff I, the start. movie I just shot, the movie I just shot, it wasn't set up to be like, Hey, this is going to do 10 million overseas and we're going to be great. You know, like it's not, it wasn't that it's like, let's make a great movie and hope that it, it, it gets a sale, you know? There's not yeah, really much of a backup right. plan. But, but you're able to so. sustain a financial living from it, from what you do, consistently, and support a family. Well, I do a multi... Yeah. I do a variety of things. You know, I work in commercials, too. Yeah. You know, produce commercials from time to time, which is, you know, pretty decent decent money. And, you know, some of these bigger movies and the TV company. And, yeah, it's just... I've, I've always done a variety of things that allow me to do the things I love, you know? If that makes sense. Yeah. So. Super cool, man. No, it's super cool. Sorry to press you on it a little bit. I just, um, I, I just, I find it really intriguing, and I think other people would as well. Like you mentioned earlier, like when you when you say you, you use the term, I, I wrote a movie. Like you said, you wrote this movie about the guy going out to the desert mm-hmm. to get sober. Like, can you just give us an insight of what that actually looks like? So, are you writing the script? Are you writing the screenplay? Like. What does it? What does that process look like, and how long does it take? Just like for someone that's starting out who might be interested. Yeah, um, it's kind of evolved over time because I've ri- I've written a few of them. Some of them I've never made. Some of them are sitting on a hard drive that I, you know, I hope I don't think I would make them anymore. Like stuff is my what I want to do is you know has changed over time, but. I don't even know if some of the early ones are any good, to be honest. You know, I haven't gone back to reread the one from, you know, 10 years ago. So, uh, but for me, it looks like, you know, first an idea and then I try to do an outline, you know, I, there's like a formula that I'll, you know, like beginning, middle and end and some of these important beats that happen. And then I'll, I'll, uh, you know, once I know what it looks like, like, you know, the 20 things that happen along the way. I'll start writing it, you know, but beforehand, okay. it's more like an, a brain dump of like the characters, this backstory stuff, and just kind of like, is this whole thing a thing? And then I'm like, okay, what does it look like? I have a plan before I start writing anything. And then I just, it's just like puzzle pieces, you know? All right. First thing, let's write that, you know, and I, I, I'm weird. Like I'm super obsessive, like I don't know if obsessive, obsessive is the right word, but like, I'll set off to write a script and I'll give myself three weeks and I have to do five pages every day. You know, I'll get up in the morning and I'll, and I'll bust out five pages and I'll quit for the day. And then the next day I'll do five more. And then the next day I'll do five more until I'm done until I have like 85 pages. And that's it. 
you know. Then it goes through some why, dude? some some edits, and I hope it's good. But they're not yeah. always good, you know. <laughs> it's it's tough. But the last but two have don't... been pretty good. Are they? Do you think? You're yeah, I think. Sometimes, I think I'm better. Um, I think I'm better. I think I'm decent when I write what I know, you know, which I try to only do that anyway. But, um, you know, I've written a couple things where I, the reaction to them wasn't as good as I'd hoped, but you know, it's all depends on who's reading it or two, yeah. but yeah, I don't know. It's hard to talk about my, myself and that, like it, I grew the way I grew up. I was like, I was never, I'm not a writer. I'm not a, you know, like. I'm not an artist. That's not like, I thought I was like science math guy. That's what, how I was, you know, it was my dad and my sister that were the, the creative people. And I thought that I had to be like a, a doctor or an engineer or a, you know, lawyer to get out of Michigan. So I went that route. So this stuff all came later. So, you know, me writing stuff, I was, you know, very insecure about it. And I probably still am quite insecure about it, but, um, um but I've had enough people, enough people that are pretty successful at their job as writers to say that this stuff is is okay so <laughs> getting the feedback yeah yeah man you don't you don't get disheartened when you get criticized or does it just motivate you to improve no i like criticism yeah i do because i i'm definitely not a pro like <laughs> AA has taught me, or AA, or sobriety, recovery. Uh, I don't want to say that. Why not? Ble- that bleep that good? out. Um, no, Why? like, Why? it's taught me to, I don't Why? know. I don't know. Whatever. But my program okay. of what, I, what I've learned, you know, is that I don't know shit. You know, I don't claim to ever know shit anymore. I mean, I know what I know, and I know what I've, what I've screwed up, and now, and I know how to do it better. But, like, I'm definitely not an expert. And, and I, I try to listen to people that have done what I'm trying to do successfully. Yeah. Before I got sober, I thought I was the smartest guy in the room, you know? So I don't think that, yeah, I don't think that anymore. I might think it, I don't act like it though. That's for sure. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. My, my, I guess my, sorry to talk about, I don't want to talk about myself, but. Do it. (laughs) <laughs> I'm tired of hearing myself talk about myself. Hey, just watch your microphone. You just you I know. I just did it. Yeah. God, rookie. Once, working with these once, am- once in 36 minutes. So working with doing? these, working with these amateurs. Oh uh, my God. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. No, um, yeah, no. My, I think my journey's been a little bit different. I, I feel like um, I, I struggled for many years once I got sober. You know, with just the rawness of of life and having to unpack. You know the damage from the past. You know, let's face it, um, and that was that was hard. I had to face up to some realities about myself that were hard to swallow. You know, and like you said, like I hadn't been an, you know, I had to learn how to be an adult at thirty-five years of age as well. You know, mm-hmm. like uh, that was hard. You know, and they say I heard this saying once that you know you, you stop growing emotionally when you take your first drink. You know, so mm-hmm. I, mean, I took my first drink when I was twelve years old. You know, so. Yeah. Uh, it's, and it's even hard for me to say that publicly, but I'll say it, you know, like it's, but I did something about it, you know, and yeah. I haven't had a hangover for nine years. I mean, yeah. that in itself is such a gift, you know, so, and I'm more predictable, I think. Would you say you're more predictable? Way more. I'm just like, like opposite, like I'm, What's the what's the what's the the most extreme version of that? I'm so predictable. Like I, my wife could probably tell you everything I'm going to do every uh, minute. You know, like I'm so in my boring. control of routine. Yeah, like uh, I'm up at four forty five a.m. I'm in bed at eight fifteen. She makes fun of me. You know, like I'm you know I'm at a meeting or I'm doing my morning thing and I'm then I'm surfing or skating or and then I'm you know work it's just like blah 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 sounds so like but yeah it's i love it so, i love it i love the predictability so full disclosure you're an inspiration to me on instagram um <laughs> really really subtly really subtly so i'll tell you why 
you do this thing and you've been doing this thing and you, I want you to give us the backstory that you, you do a tray, a tray a day, which is, um, for those that don't know, it's a skateboarding maneuver or trick. It's a 360 kickflip where the board, it's like a 360 shove it kickflip all in one go. It's, it's hard. It's not an easy thing to do. And you're doing, and you film one every single day. So, and I watch you do it and you do them so good. I love how you do it. I love your style. And I'm like, I'm the same age as that guy. Like, and he's still, he's still doing it, you know? And I'm like, and it reminds me like, I, I, I can still, I can still progress. I can still improve. And I really believe that the fact that you can do that is a gift of sobriety in itself. Do you know what I mean? Because your body works again, your brain works, you're healthy. Yeah. So thanks for the inspiration. So what's the backstory behind a tray a day? Oh, the, the tray a day I think has died for 2022 because I was like, I can't just be doing this anymore. Like I stopped. I, you know, like at the beginning of last year, I was, I would post it every day. And then it was like two months. Yeah. <clears throat> to be totally honest, there's this guy, Josh Matthews, who's a pro skater who was in the Push documentary that I, that I worked on. And he started off the year doing a switch tray a day. And I was like, oh, man, I'm just going to do a regular tray a day. And I was, like, tagging him in my, you know, in my tray a day. And, and he was, I forgot what he said a couple times. Or, all right, just let him know because, you know, um, he's a lot more popular than I am. I'm not very popular on Instagram. So there's very few of you that like, but there are a few of you that enjoyed it. And, uh, but about like a month or two into it, I think he stopped doing it. Cause he was like, I'm losing fans because <laughs> it just got old. So, but behind that, the reason I did it was because I learned like every kind of flip trick as a teenager, like everything, like regular switch. It was the early nineties. And that was yeah. like the whole thing. And then I stopped skating at 18, 19 years old, you know, I, because I drank, because of drinking. I didn't skate anymore. Like, I skated from 12 till literally my senior year of high school. And then when I went to college, I stopped. And I always claimed that I still skated, but I really never, I didn't flip my board for years. And then when I got sober, I started going to this, you know, sober skater meeting which was amazing because I was like, oh, dude, there's guys that skate that are sober. And I met a couple. It was really small at the time. Um, but I never learned tray flips that in my youth. I learned, like, every other trick except tray flips. So I couldn't do them. I could never do them. I couldn't do them in my 30s. And I, got e- I think it's easier to learn them later than it was when I was younger. But I, I was never consistent at them at all. And uh, I finally learned them, like, in my 30s and... Um, and then, when, you know, last year I was like, I got to get these down. Like this is, a, I play skate and I lose because of this fucking trick. And I'm like, I got to get this down. So I, you know, started doing them every day. I, I still don't do them on my first try that all. I did. Eh, I'm getting there. Like it's pretty, it's pretty consistent now. And, uh, but it was really to get them consistent and to copy Josh Matthews gave me the idea, but it, the thing is, like, no one really cares, but you care, so it's cool. Like, I'm like, oh, maybe I should just I do it for Shannon, you know? So, I don't know. I'm trying to get off the internet, the is, though. This is the so thing, right? I, Like, I'm trying to just be off the internet. So, I have a timer on my phone, like, how much I get to use Instagram every day, and it's two minutes a day this year. So... It's not a Bravo. lot of time. It's not a lot of time to fucking post a tray flip, but I could do that. So I just got to edit it before. I can't see who's looking at it. In two minutes, I get to do very little. It's funny, like my feed only, like by the time I, for two minutes, I can see what my skateboarder friends are doing. And, and like, I think it's like, I don't know, if sta- or stab. Like there's a surf thing, like it, nothing. Stab there's back. no tr- there's no trash in two minutes. It's actually interesting. It's like really what my close close friends are doing, and and it's nice. So, well, what, why do you feel inclined to reduce your use of social media? Because I need to get better at sitting still and not going to my phone. Like, I, I, in my own house, with the people in the room, if I'm going to my phone, it's not good, you know? And I watch my wife, bless her heart, go to her phone, 
And I'm like, this is fuck. This is awful. So, and my kid, when he walks up to me and says, put your phone away, breaks my heart, you know, but I'm addicted to my email. Just like I'm addicted to Instagram. Like I'm addicted to work worse than I'm addicted to a social media. And that's, I had to watch that, the social dilemma, that documentary. I was like, Oh my God. Like, I first told my wife how she needs to stop using this, <laughs> her phone, but at the same time, like I have an addiction to work, just le- worse than it, if I was on social media. Good news, man! Like I have an addiction to good news, and uh, so I really try to put my phone down at like you know seven thirty and not look at it again before I go to bed. Like I try, I really try to do all that stuff that you know, all these little tip tip tricks that people are given these days and part of me is like I I think I need to move my family to fucking like private beach in Mexico so I just can get my children out of this world it's scary it's fucking scary dude I try I try to do it I try to do that I moved him to Bali I did I moved moved him to Bali for that reason for exactly what you're talking about because I mean it's a toxic world that needs to be managed and I think that we live in and you're managing it and this is a question I have for you like you don't drink anymore, but have you noticed that your addictive behaviors have translated into other other ways, other things? Sure. So yeah. you mentioned work, work is one. Yeah. Social and media. It's, Anything else? There's a, you know, I surf addictively, you know, daily. Um, but it's, you know, a lot of it, the surfing isn't even, I think it's less surfing. It's more the addiction to the exercise it gives me. And the health it gives me because then I can eat whatever I want. And like, it's all like a domino effect of one another. You know, like if I don't surf for two hours or an hour and a half, I can't eat the way I want. I will get you know heavier at 44. Like I'm going to have to have like really watch what, you know, (laughs) watch what I eat. Like I, I like to eat, you know, a dessert at night. There's certain things I like, I really enjoy. And the exercise of surfing allows me to do that, you know? So if I can't, you know, going out, I was in Oklahoma city and in Atlanta for three weeks in December. And I was just like, Oh my God, you know, I'm skating every few days. My body can't handle skating every day. I'm like jogging, which sucks. My knees suck with that. You know, it's just all like, I can't imagine having to do that kind of shit, you know, like, it's just not, it's not fun. Like in surfing is such good exercise and it's fun, you know? And in the wintertime, I'm, like, just walking my block in front of my house, and I'm in the water, and it's, like, such a beautiful thing. And and I don't know, you know? It's just, yeah, there's definitely, like, certain addictions. But I think they're they're much healthier than the old shit, for sure, you know? Yeah, that's how I justified it. But, I mean, if I'm but honest. But if I was like, going to the gym every day, would you say I was addicted to the gym? No, I'm just going yeah. to the gym to be healthy right exercise well, but i just think if you're doing anything to the detriment of those around you so i'll i'll be straight with you i think i mean i surfed i surfed too much yeah you know when i should have been home with my family at times you know um, I, that's, I think there was moment there was a couple of years where i was you know like i just took an rv trip with my family up the coast right and we went all the way from here to santa cruz and we stopped like the old me would have made sure I surfed every single day of that trip in a different spot, right? I was happy to get two hours four times in an eight-day trip. And that was it. And I would let my wife know a day ahead of time. I was like, hey, I'm going to hit this spot, you know, right here. And it's Car- like just north of Carmel. I can pull the RV up. You guys do your thing. I'm going to be in the water for two hours. So, like, let's not make a thing, you know. But then, you know, I'd spend the other two days driving my kids to skate parks and, like, the aquarium or whatever we were doing. So, like, I'm learning to be less of, like, I'm learning to be better at not putting it first, you know? Yeah. But it's still getting yeah. enough to make my body feel good, so. Yeah, and that's that's where I struggled. I'm like, oh, it's a healthy thing. and I'm, At least I'm not drinking, but, you know, really, like, the, the time away... It's just, I think it can't, it come, it can be a really selfish endeavor. Uh, it's funny you mentioned surfing. Yeah, I mean, even, I mean, skateboarding is the same, going to the gym. Uh, I think finding balance is tricky. But another thing I want to ask you about, because we are talking a lot about sobriety, let's just not, let's not bet around the bush. Uh, do you drink coffee? 
Yeah, a lot. Yeah, I mean, how have you, how's is that is it problematic <clears throat> for you? I want to back up one second because I think this my health. I've never been healthier than I am you now. Look, you look healthy. You do. I really, I've never been this healthy. Like yeah. I've never been able to jump how yeah. I jump, like even on a skateboard or I'm like, I'm not a good surfer, but I like, I, I feel yeah. okay out there and I have a good time. But I think the, the amount of years I'm adding on my life by being this healthy is worth the commitment to the exercise you know, because if I'm just like a, a slob not taking care of myself, I'm no good for my kid. How am I going to run around with my four year old in 20 years at, at 64 years old if I'm not healthy as hell? You know, so I don't know. I don't know what's like if you're thinking long term, I'm not being that selfish. You know, I want to be the best I can for a long period of time. So if I'm not getting that kind of exercise, then I don't know how else I'm going to get it and how I'm going to like. I wouldn't be doing tray flips like I'm doing if I wasn't doing the exercise I'm doing, you know? Yeah, and that's, that's why you're an inspiration to me. And it just keeps reminding me because I'm, I'm still, I've never stopped skating. <laughs> you, I was just laughing because I'm like hearing myself talk and I'm like, you're talking to like a, just a regular guy about skateboarding and, and surfing. Like this is not, there's no pro level here. Like it, I just don't ever hear people. Yeah, no, it's cool. Like I, I just don't, I'm just a regular person. <laughs> About how he does tray flips and surfing. Define, define regular person lies, you know? Like, uh, come on uh, now, man. I don't know. You're not a, yeah. You know, like, I just think it just... It just not a pro the, athlete. That's uh, like a, just a regular, but, regular old guy. But I guess the, po- the, the point is, and I see this with the podcast, is like, you're living, like the way you're living your life, you have to be doing it. And there's just that one element of it that's just speaking to me. Yeah. A pro, a pro skater can post a tray a day. I, you know, Nigel can post a tray a day, which he probably he does in various ways. Doesn't resonate with me. Yeah. But, uh, but for some reason, it's, it's it, the way you're doing it and, and given your age and the context of it all just really speaks to me. You yeah. know? And, and, and you never know where you're going to find inspiration and you never know who you're going to learn off. You know, and again, going back to what you're talking about with the meeting stuff, you know, I, you know, look, I go to those things as well. And there's times I, I, I go, I walk in and I look around the room and I go, I've got nothing in common with a single one of these people. And then some random dude who's a, you know, a carpenter who's been a carpenter his whole life and we've got nothing in common says some shit that I would have never been able to relate to if anyone else had said it. Yeah. You know, and, it, and it's just totally. opening your mind and, and, and having a growth mindset and being willing to learn off others and, and humble yourself that much. So I'm talking too much, but I will say, like, you do a good no, trade No, it's flip. important. Okay, there it is. Thanks. <laughs> I even posted one the other day. The one I did two days ago, the one I did two days ago was very, very good. I'm telling you. I don't say that about good. it much. I have a weird arm thing that's not, my right left arm doesn't catch up the right way, so... I like the left arm thing you do. It's just like Steve. <laughs> it's you, do them fa- you, do them, you do them at speed, though. You do them fast. It's like, yes. Yeah. He's not, did I send you the he's, batch he's of like seven things, seven things I did? Oh, uh, did no. you text them to me? Yeah, send them to me. I don't know that I, if I did or not. Me. Yeah, it's interesting. I can't remember. Oh, I didn't send you them yeah. all. But um, I just want to... I want to just like it's been it's been epic, Lige, and I know you're a busy man, and I don't want to dig into your bedtime too much because I know it's it's the evening in Venice over there. Um, but I, I just want to go back a little bit to your like you creative, Lige, you know, movie maker, film producer, mm-hmm. Lige. What advice would you give to someone who would like to start out in the industry that you're in? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> go do something else. Oh my god! I wish I started doing this in like the '80s. There's just so many less. There's so many. There's, there's just so many people doing it. There's so much stuff being made. It's so hard. Mm. Even when you get like, and I'm not saying that to be negative. Like I'm super positive about. It. Like I'm here. You stay in line and you get there. Like <clears throat> there's a movie I've been working on for two years, and today we finally got the lead for the movie you know today and everybody was like ready to give up a month ago i was like all right well whatever you know and i was like i told everyone on the phone see you just have to keep at it 
just keep at it, you know. So just keep at it. Keep uh, at it. You know, we'll try to put the money together really quickly and shoot it in April. April before the snow melts. But advice is, you know, what's crazy. I'll talk about my wife for a second because she's. I'm 44. She's close behind me. She's a like when I fell in love with her however many years ago, I don't remember, like 12, 10, 12, uh, when I met her, because she wrote this novel, this like historical fiction book about Josephine and Napoleon and all this. I was, she's this crazy story behind it. And <clears throat> I just was like, wow, she wrote a book. Like, that's incredible. You know, she went to art school. She's a great painter. She's all this, this stuff. And she's fought for a career in this business for a long, 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 long time wanted to give up over and over. She's had a lot of successes, like a you know, model and whatever. I mean, and, but she's just hasn't had that opportunity in, in, in writing, you know? And she finally this year, last year, got into this, on this show as a writer. In her, in her, and it's, it's incredible, like, that, she, that she, all that time she finally got there. So, I don't know, I had an acting, like I was an actor a long time ago. Don't look it up. No, I can say it. I can say it, man. <laughs> but I, uh, I was not very good at it. Um, but I had a teacher go, look, this, this city, it's just, it's, it's one big line. You know, if you just stay in line, you will get to the front. If you get out and you quit or take breaks, you got to go back to the end of the line, you know, but if you just stay in line, you'll get to the front. So I've always just kept trying to work on the stuff I'm working on, you know, and stuff falls off, new stuff comes in, but. You know, even when you think nothing's going to happen a year ago, I got too many things happening right now, you know? Mm. Mm. And it's just because we just don't quit on any of them. Some of them, but usually it's not yeah. me that's wanting to quit. And, yeah, I think you just, you get to the front of the line if you just stay in it. Just um, through but, but this But this, this industry, I don't know. I didn't go to film school. I didn't do anything the, the, like the <laughs> appropriate way or, or whatever way. So I just kind of fell into this and... I didn't know what I wanted to do as a, as a professional or as a, as a grown up, you know, from all the high school and college I went to, it was never anything I wanted to do. It was all stuff I thought I had to do to get out of the situation I was in. So when I fell into this, like acting stuff, which led me to like, I don't want to wait for a job. So I'm going to make a movie. And then I kind of made this thing and I was like, Oh, I liked producing that. I should, produce a movie so I can show people that I could produce a movie and just learn by doing it. And then I ended up directing that movie. And when I drove home from that like four day shoot, I was like, that's what I want to do. This is what I want to do. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And that was the 30, right? Like I felt it in the car driving on the freeway from this fucking closed down restaurant. We turned into a set, you know, and made it for like no money and whatever. But I drove home and I'm like, that was, that's what I want to do. You know? So ever since then I've been, I think really it's that that was me directing something, right? And I haven't got to do that a lot over the last 14 years, but I do all the other stuff so I can do it once in a while, you know? So, yeah. but all the other stuff makes me better at doing that. So, I don't know. It's just, uh, right, man. that's no advice other than, I guess, just like <laughs> try a bunch of shit, you know, until you figure it out. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing your experience with it. Like that's that's all it is. You've just shared yeah. your experience with it, and then you know, like um, I agree because I'm I'm sort of feeling it with this little podcast project that I do. It's been a few years now, you know, and I, I waver in terms of uh, why do I do this? Is it like where am I actually going with this? You know, am I actually making a difference with it? And um, yeah, I don't know. Just thought I'd get your take on on being involved in that sort of process of things. But but it ch every year it changes. Like every year I kind of recalibrate, like, what am I doing? Like, what do I want to do all of this? Do I want to undo? Mm -hmm. Like, so even this year I'm like, I don't want to do as many movies. I'm going to try to work on more TV and I'm just going to kind of like, you know, just adjust the levels and like, I want to spend more time with my family. I want to, I actually don't want to work as much as I can. <laughs> I don't want to work. I love what I do, but I'm trying to work the least amount as I, I try to <laughs> work the least amount <laughs> Or the the least well, I have why? to in order because I want to hang out with my kid, my kids, and I want to fucking hang out with my friends, and I want to surf, and I want to skate, and I want to do the stuff that's going to be gone one day. The work, like no one's, like, 
it'd be pretty rare for me to like, you know, you're not going to remember more than a handful of guys for forever. Right. Like these yeah. guys will talk, my kids will talk about me forever. <laughs> Yeah, good point. My legacy's at my house, you know? It's not about my job. Oh, that's good. That's good. I never thought about that. It's really nice. Right? Yeah. Like, everybody, go, like, my wife's mom died four months ago. We don't talk about her anymore. Like, I'm being straight up. Once in a while, she'll break down. Like, I miss my mom. But, like, people die and it's it. It's over. Like, what's the point? You know, we work so hard at all this shit that means nothing. You know, and I'm just learning that now. Like, I'm really just seeing that. Like, ah, God, what am I grinding so much for? Like, none of it matters. My legacy is inside. <laughs> Raising that four-year-old so he can grow up and be somebody. That's yeah. what's more important, you know? And the 13-year-old and, you know. But, I mean, is that is that attitude a product of privilege as well, though? Like, um, in terms of you have all the things that you need in terms of shelter and food and you know, um, I oh, mean, yeah. if I mean, those, I mean if, if those things were in being jeopardized, would your, you know, would your attitude change maybe? Uh, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure it yeah. would change. You know, yeah. you got to eat and, you know, but we like, I don't know. I don't want to try to even put myself in anybody else's shoes in any other country or, or any other yeah. situation. I didn't grow up with money. <laughs> like I know what it's yeah. like to not have anything. Yeah. Pretty good. Like I got pretty good practice with that. And so we live at a, we live at a low means, you know, we don't like, we're not out there, you know, making it rain because it's, we don't want to have like the more money, more problems thing is, is true. <laughs> it really is like to a point, I think there's a good, like, there's this like sweet spot you can stay at where it, mm. for us, for my family, my wife might, might not say the same thing, but I've found like a sweet spot where like, I don't know, have you, you go buy the bigger you... house, you got the more, like, it's just more work. More work, you know? I don't know. Have you we seen wanna... that? Because you live in Venice, California. So yeah. are, you exp- are, you, are, you, are you exposed to those, those levels of wealth and then also on the other end of the scale? Hun- I've lived in the poverty? same place for 16 years now. Same place. Yeah, so you, know, so, so you, I, you associate with wealthy people and you see that how toxic money can be for them? Yeah, I mean, there's so many toxic people around here. <laughs> but it's, you know, I, I don't know. It's a whole thing, but I, 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 we're, we're stoked. We have great places to eat. There's nice streets. When I moved in here, there was like nothing like that around here. It was like, don't go outside. I lived with this girl. She's one of my best friends these days. And I was like, don't go outside at night. That's what Venice used to be like, you know, right where I live. And now it's like, there's definitely more crazy people out there that are, you know, I think drugs have done a lot to what people out on the streets than they used to be. All, yeah. uh, also, I don't want to sound like some privileged guy talking about what it's like to be out there. Like, that's not yeah. my place. But it's, it's different now. It's in a completely different way. It's very wealthy. Very, very mm. wealthy. I'm not always a huge fan of the people I meet or see on the street. But yeah. I'm a huge fan of, like, what we have around here, what we have access to. Like, Lost where my all. kid gets to go to school, you know. Mm. Um, it's a great elementary school. Free. Right up the street. Awesome school, right? Is it, called Ven- is it called Venice Elementary? No, it's called Quarter Lane. Quarter Lane. Oh, it's like a French word, but oh, cool. I call it Quarter Lane. Yeah. 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 Um, it sounds cool. Yeah. River went there, and the cash gets to go there. And, like, it's hard to leave here. Like, we talked about moving, but it's like I'm gra- grandfathered into this three-bedroom that I, I live in, you know? It's rent-controlled. It's, it's just nice. It's like we don't have to you know, blood, sweat, and tears to, to continue to do what we're doing, you know, like, hmm. that would suck. Yeah, it would, man. Hey, so, listen, um, it's work been smarter, epic. not harder. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you just, um, you've just recovered from COVID, yeah? How was your experience yeah. with it? You okay? You I, feel like okay. Su- I feel like Superman right now. Do like, you? I'm double vaxxed and boosted and COVID d- through, you know, like, our whole family is. Um, yeah. yeah. It was like five hours of, like, I got hit by a train. Is that and, all? Five hours? Wow. Yeah, it's funny. Like, 
I went to go. My son tested positive before school. Like we had to take. We forgot to take him. We went on this RV trip. We must have got at the yeah. Monterey Aquarium because it's the only time we were around anybody. I'm so pissed right. we went there. But <clears throat> we were in line to get him tested the day before school, and my wife calls me because she came and tagged me out because I was in line with him first. Yeah, and, and it calls me. She's like, he just tested positive. I was like, what? She's like, but I'm negative. And I was like, I'm fine. I feel fine. I did a, a home test. I was negative. Next day, I'm like, I should just go get one of those PCR tests. And <clears throat> I go get in line. And when I'm in line, I'm like, oh, I, I got COVID. I felt That's it. Like, I felt it come on, you know? Like, I felt it come on. And then I t- he tells me I'm positive, And I go home. And I'm like, whew. Because I surfed that morning. And then I got in bed. And I just took a little nap. And then my kid came home. And he was sick. Or no, he was home. And he got in bed with me. And my wife was like zero compassion for me because i'm never sick and i'm never hurting so she was like i we got in a huge fight and it by seven o'clock at night i was like we're i'm screaming at her we're fighting and i'm yeah. just fucking yelling and yeah you don't even care this and that i'm in pain i'm in real pain i never s-. and then she walked out of the room and i was like i'm healed i'm healed it's gone it's out of i just yelled it out of my body I felt so good. And then that night I had like a rough sleep. And the next day I was, I, you know, the next day I, I'll, I'm going to stop being uh, completely honest right now <laughs> the rest of my week. Um, but I started getting exercise, you know, and uh, I was feeling good right away. Good. And nice. my, uh, my kid recovered quick. And the 13 year old, he had like cold symptoms and my wife was out for a couple of days. So, but we were all through it in a few days. You know. Yeah, nice. Now it's just interesting to get someone else's how it's affected someone else on the other side of the world. Like that's yeah. what I find curious. Like, yeah, because I've had my experience with it. It's very similar. Although I was probably more like your wife, where it, it lasted for. I was laid out for three or four days, and I'm yeah. double vaccinated as well. Um, it just yeah, and then, yeah. I think we're just lucky that this is the batch that we got. You know, because my yeah. wife's mom wasn't as lucky. You know, yeah. So. Sorry to hear that. You know? I yeah. Don't know. It's crazy. Yeah, but the same thing, I was lining up for a PCR test only because I was, someone I knew said, hey, I'm, my boyfriend's tested positive. You better go and get yourself checked out. I'm like, oh, I feel sweet. And I lined up for a PCR test. And as I'm in the line, because yeah. it was an hour long line, I got this weird sweat. I'm like, I'm sweating <laughs> for no reason. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. And then, it's, and then as the test is swabbing me, I was like, I've got it. I know I've yeah. got it. <laughs> so so yeah. I spent Christmas Eve all the way through to New Year's uh, isolating. Yeah. yeah. But it was it was a hard time for me. I was alone the whole time. But yeah. um, I was actually, I think the universe kind of said, you need this time yeah. uh, to, to yourself. And I did a few things that I have needed to do and haven't done for a while. It's really good. Actually, you know what I did? I listened. I want to advocate for this. I read this book by Eckhart Tolle like years ago when it first came out, like The Power of Now. And then I actually, while I was in isolation, I listened to the audio book and I forgot how fucking epic good, that book is. Yeah. It's really epic. Like it's, if, for those of you that have already read it and maybe haven't and put it down for a while, maybe go back to it and revisit it. And it's sort of in line with what you've been saying, Lige, in terms of like just being conscious of your thought and then also being present. And yeah. and uh, and especially when you got kids, I mean, if you ever need a reason to be in the present moment, like kids are the best reason to keep, stay in that present moment. So I just yeah, he was sort of say that. Like two days ago, he kept taking my phone and hiding it, like in the couch, like hiding it when I wasn't around. I was like, "Where's my phone?" And he'd be like sitting on. He's four, like that's sm- like. And he just would, like, not say anything and totally be tricking me. And I have this fucking thing I would just watch that makes it ding. And I'm like, yeah, so I don't know. But, you uh, you know, like, you get to be, you get to be alone for 10 days. I, I was in an RV with my whole family and another teenager and then got home <laughs> thinking we were going back to regular life. And then we all get COVID. So then I'm stuck in this house with them all for, you know, 10 more days. So I would have traded you for the <laughs> alone in a second. Um <laughs> Yeah, I'd say uh, yeah. I know, I know the feeling, man. You get it's it's busy. 
Hey, listen, man, it's been epic. Um, I, listen, I ask all guests to come to the podcast with a cause they want to support or advocate for. Uh, I don't think I gave you any warning on that. If you no. have a charity, or, uh, no, I didn't. Sorry, I'm hopeless. With I, can, I have one, it. but I know that my friends do this feed the streets thing in in LA all the time. Is that count? Okay, for would you like to advocate yeah. for that? Yeah, yeah. I don't. Cool. Yeah, um, I don't know what else to say to advocate for it, but uh, so feed the streets. Yeah, so no worries. Yeah. I'll put and uh, I'll put a link to that in in uh, this episode. Yeah, I'll get notes. you what it is, but it's. Uh, you know, Skid Row, stuff and like what, that. Do you know what bunch, they do A bunch exactly? of sober guys take take meals out. To homeless people? Yeah. Yeah, how, how is the homeless crisis in where you live? Is it pretty shocking? I, I don't know. I don't think so. Like, people say it is, but those people all moved here. You know, like, there's always been a lot of homeless around here. Uh, okay. I mean, there's a lot of tents and stuff. And yeah, I guess it's, it's kind of crazy, but who am I to say anything about it you know like yeah. i don't know they're not on become, my, yeah become worse since the pandemic uh i can't tell i feel like it's been like this for a while i don't i think it was like pre-pandemic was like this but they like yeah. There'll be a whole, like, all of Venice Boulevard, and then that'll get cleaned up, and then it'll go down to a different place. It just kind of moves around, and, um, mm. you know? Right. Definitely a lot worse than it used to be. I can imagine. Yeah. It's, no, some people are... here. Yeah. It can be scary, you know? I can imagine. Not because not a homeless, but just some of these, some people are just fucking, like, I don't know. It's just crazy. Drugs, man. So glad I don't do them anymore. Yeah, same. And I mean, I think uh, I see it in my hometown. Um, we have a real problem with the drug ice, you know, and I just see what it does to people. And they become very scary humans when they're on it. But I, I think you and I are probably the same. When, when I see someone now who's on drugs, you know, I, I, I don't see it. I see, I see someone just crying out for help. You know, the, the drugs and alcohol, are a, the drugs are a symptom of, of uh, their mental health and I no, I just have nothing but compassion for them these days, you know. Um, so, yeah, yeah, totally. But they could be walking with a machete in their hand, you know, you know, like waving it around, and that gets a little that's gnarly, tough. you know. And that's that's that's, that's what's the common sight around here is just like really? a golf club swinging. Yeah, that's why it's it's like weird now. It's like not like it used to be. Just it's 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 a lot of there's a lot of mental health stuff that's that's tough, you know. And uh, yeah, man, it's it definitely. Is. Yeah, I don't know. It makes me grateful. Yeah, man. Well, listen, um, if you scroll down on this episode, you'll find a link to Feed the Streets, uh, and you can find uh, this episode on TerribleHappyTalks.com, and you can also find it on all of the major podcast platforms, such as iHeartRadio, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Buzzsprout, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and whatever platform you like to listen on, it always helps if you subscribe and leave a review. Just helps spread it through the intra-web thingy. Uh, that always helps. So, Lige, man, thanks so much for your time. It's always a pleasure. I'm going to go and do some tray flips and film them and send them to you. I'll be bringing them back for you. Maybe I'll do a tray a week. A tray a week. <laughs> tray a week. Hey, it's quality, not quantity, but it better be the best damn tray flip. That week. Well, I stopped. Week. I didn't tell you this. Uh, everybody's hung up now, but this is just for you. Uh, <laughs> everybody's hung up now. <laughs> two, like two, three months into it, I stopped uh, doing it every day because I was like, I can't maintain this every So if I missed two days, yeah. I would do three that third day. And then for a while, I was posting all three of those. <laughs> and then I was like, nah, I just like post them one every. Yeah, like once every, a couple times a week. But I would do as many days that I missed, you know, so I would yeah. make sure I did. Like, if I missed five days, I would do five good ones that day, you know, so it's such a stand up. I don't know. You're I'm still filming them. I just haven't posted any this year. Post I'll, go, them all. I'll post them all. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Shan. Mm-hmm.